Praise God. We're delighted to be able to get into chapter 13 tonight. And what a what a journey. We're almost through the book of 1 Corinthians. I'm not sure if we're going to go to 2 Corinthians. I'm going to be praying about that because I I, I, I want to be led by the Spirit of God. I don't want to just get in and sing, you know, from book to book to book. We want to go where the Holy Spirit leads us, right? Yes, amen. And I certainly want to do that when I get behind this pulpit. 1 Corinthians is a very powerful, it has been a very powerful uh, book to go through. And I, I think I think it speaks to us in such a way because, you know, we still, we still as the church, find times that we need correction from the Word of God. We still as the church find ourselves pursuing things that, that may, may not necessarily be bad in, in a sense, but it may not always be what God's will is. So tonight we're going to be talking about some of this this pursuit and and uh, sometimes uh, it's not it's not the, the things that of God that we pursue that are wrong it's the way we prioritize them that can become a problem and so tonight we're going to First Corinthians chapter thirteen which is the love chapter but before we begin that we, we've got to go back to First Corinthians twelve thirty one and this is what Paul said in the New Living Translation so. You should earnestly desire the most helpful gifts. But now let me show you a way of life that is the best of all. The Corinthians, we have found, were never with the active spiritual gifts. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with desiring. As a matter of fact, Paul praises them in the beginning. In the beginning of 1 Corinthians, he praises them for their sincere desire, their, their hunger for the things of God, their, their desire to seek the spiritual gifts or the, the, the spiritual abilities that the Holy Spirit gives us. But the, the issue that we're going to be finding out is that they had a priority issue. They were pursuing spiritual gifts, but they were neglecting the greater need to pursue love and action. See, this is not about getting, you know, getting a grocery list of things from the Spirit. This is not about honing in on one gift and doing it well. But this is about this is this is about the life of, of, a, of a man or woman who follows Jesus Christ. This is about a person that is empowered and led by the Spirit of God. And so, when we forget that God is love, when we forget that love was the sole purpose that brought Jesus to this earth, we, we are saved not because it was some kind of conquest for Jesus to achieve in the heavens, uh, to, to put a notch on his belt or to put another gem in his crown. We were saved for God so loved the world. And so in everything that we pursue, we must remember that it, it, is, it is not a, an external type of mystical power that we, you know, like some, you know, you know, charmed uh, necklace or emblem that we wear. It's not something that we take on and put, put on and put off, but it is, it is in Him that we live and move and have our being. And so when we pursue these things, our motivation should be to pursue love in action. So 1 Corinthians 13, 1 says this, If I can speak all of the languages of the earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy and I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but didn't love others, I would be nothing. 
Now the ancient Greek word, you know, uh, tones, has the simple idea of languages. And it's, it's funny that Paul would mention this, as we know that the Corinthians were eager to seek the spiritual gifts, but they were particularly interested in the gift of tongues. Now in 2024, we sort of lost the meaning of this, and I think, I think one of the reasons that we lost the meaning of this is the simple idea that, that the word that, that is translated is translated into languages in some places such as Acts 2.11 and Revelation 5.9. And, and this has some, led some to believe that the gift of tongues is simply the ability to communicate the gospel in other language or, or the ability to uh, quickly learn language. Now, I want to tell you that the gift of tongues has stuff to do with that as well. I can tell you my wife has a gift. I, we could go and, and we've done this. We, we've traveled into other countries and it blows my mind because I, I feel so ignorant because I can, you know, I can say it, but it's hard to get around that Texas accent. <laughs> but we've been places where they're speaking a language that you, you know, we think Spanish would be easier. You can do that pretty, pretty well. But we've been, we went to Brazil where they're speaking Portuguese, which is a mixture of several languages, and she was able to pick up the language with, with, within, you know, a week's time. She was telling me what people were saying. One time we were watching a, a funeral in, that was in India. Somebody that we, uh, George and his father, we were watching, and, and I'm sitting there, my brains are scrambled like eggs, you know. I, I, I don't know what they're talking about. But all of a sudden, my wife said, I'm starting to pick up some words. I said, you've got the gift. <laughs> Only somebody that had the gift of the spirit, the gift of tongues, would be able to do this. And so, that's a great ability. And then he says, if, if I can speak all the languages of the earth. But there's an additional thing that he says. And of angels. And so that's why I say when we when we see this, we sort of it's sort of lost on us. Why would they eagerly pursue the gift of tongues, especially tongues out of all of the, the gifts? I mean, if I was eagerly pursuing a gift, I would want the, the ability to do miracles. Amen. Especially with my discuss, praise the Lord. Gold. <laughs> you know, I, I would want the ability to, to lay hands upon the sick and heal them. I would want to be able to prophesy, or I would want knowledge that I can tell you what's you know the, the, the most intimate secrets of your heart. But here these guys are seeking this gift of tongues more than all. Because it historically had more to do with just speaking other languages on the earth. But Paul wrote this at the time 1 Corinthians was written. Many people, especially the Jews, believed that angels had their own language. That there was a heavenly, a, a heavenly language. And by the Spirit, one could not only speak it, but even as the Spirit gave utterance, but also understand it as the Spirit opened their ear. So this reference to tongues shows that even, you know, even if you had the ability to speak all of the languages of the world and have the genuine gift to speak the legitimate language of heaven that is not spoken in human, but to speak the, the language of the angels and speak to God in prayer. Well, this was why it was so powerful to them. Paul also listed in this prophecy and knowledge and faith to do miracles. Those are the ones that I would be gravitating towards, you know, too. But, but because the problem was is that they were seeking these 
But as we found out in earlier chapters, the priorities were messed up. We see in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 where we go to read the Bible to take our communion where Paul taught them how to take the Lord's Supper. He had to teach them because they were leaving others out. There were, there were some that were going hungry and some that were thirsty because they were uh, you know, maybe not as wealthy and they didn't have anything to eat with them. And then while some were in one part of the, the, the fellowship uh, getting full of delicious food and drinking wine and getting literally, the, he said, getting drunk. Uh, he, he said, you, you guys were there to have a party, but you're missing the whole point. And so Paul is, is, is reminding them, he'd already dealt with this issue. And, and you know, he said, it, it would be better for you to stay at home. It'd be more beneficial because you, your, 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 your presence in the house of God is of no benefit. So here, a couple of chapters later, just a little bit on into the letter, Paul said, you know, he's, he's reminding them, I'm, I'm, I'm so happy that, that you pursue the gifts of the Spirit, that you have a desire for the gifts of the Spirit. He said, but now I want to teach you a, a better way of life, a more excellent way. The way of love. And so what is Paul speaking of? Well, in the English language, you know, love has a broad meaning. We just have the word love. You know, we, we, the Greeks, they had several different words for love. But us, you know, you, you have to interpret what I'm saying in the context of the, of the, the conversation. Because I can love spaghetti and I can love my wife. And I better love one more than the other. <laughs> But in the Greek, there were several words. There were four words for love. And one word was eros, which is describing an erotic love, where we get the word erotic. It is that physical love, that, that, that temporal love. And then there was storage, which was the second word for love. And it, it referred to the familial love that a parent could have for a child or, or between a husband and wife or family members. And then there was the philia, which is the word for love that speaks of brotherly friendship and sisterly friendship and affection. It is a deep love that, that is shared between friends and it's a, a partnership that might be described as, as a very high form of love. Thank God we have a friend in God. And then there's the fourth word for love, which is agape. Now there are some that said this is the love of heaven. Well, you know, I, 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 I sort of disagree with that because uh, we're not really able, we're not, we're not really able to love people as God loves people. We are, we're, we, we can't even imagine the depth of God's love. We can't even begin to describe or grasp hold of what it truly means to be loved by God. The Bible uses the same word agape love for uh, our love for sin. So what is this, this word agape love? It is a love that is being used in this, this description. So we've got to know what it means in context. It is a love that loves without, without changing. It is a self-giving love. Thank God for the self-giving love of Jesus Christ. It is a self-giving love that loves without demanding or expecting repayment. It is a love so great that it can be given to the unlovable or unappealing. It is a love that loves even when it's rejected. Agape love loves because it wants to love. And it does not demand or expect repayment from the love that is given. It gives because it loves. It does not love in order to receive. Say, well, how can that? How can be agape and sin? Well, you go down uh, where they're, they're smoking crack or whatever the drugs are doing today, and and you will find that that people love that even though it is destroying them. So that's what it means when it says that men love have an agape towards the things of sin. People will literally love to drink alcohol even. 
even though it's killing them. They have cirrhosis of the liver and they're literally dying, but they, they've got to go back. So it's a self-sacrificing type of blood. Uh, but it can also mean in, in, a, in a way where we are not expecting anything in return. A God type of blood. And according to uh, Alan Redpath, we get our English word uh, agony from agape. It means the actual absorption of our being in one great passion. Strictly speaking, agape cannot be defined as God's love because men, as I said before, men are said to agape sin, John 3.19 and 1 John 2.15. But it is defined as sacrificial, giving, absorbing kind of love. And the word has little to do with our feelings and our emotions. It has more to do with self-denial for the sake of another. So now we understand what that word means. What that type of love means. Even in, in a marriage, uh, we depend on one another. And, and our, our divorce rate in the world, not just in the United States, is so high because there, there is uh, an agreement between the two that come together. There's a covenant that's made that they will, you know, that they will live up to certain expectations uh, biblically of what it means to be married. But agape love does not demand anything in return, and it loves no matter what. In the South, you know, we like to look at love and we think uh, Paul's saying that, you know, if we're unfriendly, we, then our lives mean left nothing. But agape does not have anything to do with just friendliness. Uh, now, our love is kind, so don't get me wrong. But we're not talking about kindness at this point. And, and sometimes we think that we, if we'll love better if we will treat people a little bit more kindly. But, but the, the beginning, the opening, the, the pathway to, to living a life of love is to, to live it in such a way that we love without any expectation of something being returned to us. I think a great way of agape love is like this, this young woman that was on the street. Uh, when, you, when you do something for somebody that, that is completely lost, uh, that is on the street that is bound by drugs, you, you cannot do it with the expectation of receiving anything. You're the one that is giving. Jesus came to this world knowing that there would be many that would reject him, despise him, and even put him on the cross. But yet he came because of the company. So 1 Corinthians 13, 3 says this, if I gave everything I have to the poor, even sacrifice my body, I could boast about it, but if I did not love others, I would have gained nothing. Now Jesus told the rich young ruler in Matthew 19, 16, uh, this is what you must do. He said, I want you to give all of your possessions away and give it away to the poor and then come and follow me. But here we see in 1 Corinthians 13, 3, that even if we do that and have not love, if the rich young ruler would have said yes and had had a motivation that was not in love, but to gain the wealth of the world, to gain the riches of God's kingdom, it would have been of no profit. I don't know, sometimes we don't, we don't see exactly what, what, what is being said. When, when Paul talks about this, he, he's talking about the, this, the same rich young ruler. When he brings this up, he said, you can give everything away to the poor. Sell all that you have. But if you have not love, it will profit you nothing. He said, though I sacrifice my body, and even if I lay my life down and, and martyr them, apart from love, it is no profit. Now normally no one would doubt the spiritual credentials of someone who gave away everything they had and gave up their life and martyred them. 
But, but those are not the best measures of someone's true spiritual credentials. And I, I give you a modern day case in point. Look at these, these people, these terrorists that they get these young poor children and they raise them up and they take care of them and feed them. And, and just so they can implant and instill a, a mentality of suicide and, and taking other people out and becoming a martyr for God. But in reality, their motivation is not love, but power. This type of martyrdom has always been around, and it was even around in the early days of, of Christians. And there were some early Christians that were so arrogant to think that, it, that the blood of martyrdom would wash away every sin that they had. And I want you to know something. It, that there is nothing that we can do that makes us righteous before God. It is all because of Jesus. It is because he hung on the cross. And if we could have done that, then, then we would still be back in the law. But it, it takes more than just my life. It took innocent life, a spotless, blameless life. And there have been people that are proud to be able to endure the suffering of Christ, but, but that's not the most important thing in the life of a Christian. In the life of the Christian, the better way, the more excellent way is to be able to love like Jesus Christ. Love in action. Live a life of love. More than giving all of your possessions away. More than, more than giving your life as a martyr. More than, uh, you know, suffering with Jesus. When we love like Jesus loved. And we're motivated by that love. Not just so people will pat us on the back or that God will give us something more. And that's why I preach, you know, again, you know, we pursue the things of the Spirit through our, our works and our actions. And we think, well, if I give this amount of money away, then God will bless me more. No, God has already blessed you all that you can be blessed. You have become a son and daughter of God. Do you not realize that you have to do nothing more except Receive what God has for you. That's called love. It's not expecting anything in return from you. And each thing that is described in 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3 is a good thing. Tongues are good. Prophecy is good. Knowledge is good. Faith is good. Thank God for people that are, that are walking in faith. Sacrifice is good. There's nothing wrong with those things. There's nothing wrong with, you know, giving a sacrifice, uh, you know, financially or, or giving your life to the Lord. Those are all wonderful things. But without love, they lose their value. And let me make it more plain. Without, without love, there is no salvation. Right? Without the, the love of Christ, without abiding in Him, there is no salvation. You can do all of these things, but it will be for not if Christ isn't living within you. You see, what Paul is saying is that if, if Christ lives in us, then we're going to be led into that most excellent way. It doesn't mean that we automatically know it. We've got to learn. And here Paul is teaching the first first Corinthians, he's teaching the Corinthians the more excellent way, as one version says, but it is the way of life for the Christian, for the believer. And, and so we must pursue love. And all of those other things will come. When we love, then we're, we're opening ourselves up to be used by the Spirit more perfectly. Amen? Because we're moved by compassion. What calls Jesus to stop. What caused Jesus to, to heal those that, that called out? It, it was always because he, he was moved by compassion. He was moved by love. And so tonight we're going to we're going to look at uh, you know the first two things uh, in in First Corinthians we see uh, six things that love is not in the total chapter, and eight things or six things that love is, and eight things that love is not. So tonight we're going to look at love is patient and, you know, you know for time. 1 Corinthians uh, 13, 4 says, love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud. You 
You see, we see in the beginning that Christian love is described with words of action. We see in the beginning when Paul begins to describe what love is. Love is not lofty words or ideas. Christian love is not about how we feel. When we come into the house of God, when, when we're walking, if we've got to be in the mood, Amen. If somebody's got to coax us just the right way, or, you know, and, and don't get me wrong, I, there are songs that I love. There are songs that just, they, I just love those songs. But I cannot be motivated in how I live my life by getting what I want. It's a treat for me for a certain song to be saying, uh, it's, a, it's a treat for me. You know what? You know what really makes me happy and excited when I see new people, people getting saved. That makes me more than any song. I just, it makes me walk on cloud nine for yeah, weeks on end. It excites me to know it. I love to hear about young ladies getting off the street. I love to hear about churches being built in Turkey that we're a part of. I love those kinds of things. That's what gets me going. But what if we weren't seeing positive things? What if people weren't coming in the door? What if people weren't getting saved? What if people were persecuting us openly because we are Christians? See, it's a little bit harder to operate in love uh, and walk in Christ. And have that action when our motivation was never love to begin with. And so love is patience. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord isn't really being slow about His promise as some people think. No, He is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. Thank God. He's patient with me. It is in this verse that we see the Lord's patience towards us. And as Christians, sometimes we fail to see that even in our own personal lives, God has given us time to repent instead of choosing to condemn us. Yes. For Jesus did not come to, to condemn, but to save. So what does that say? That means that God chose. God could have chosen to condemn us the very moment that we were born, the very moment that we sinned, but instead, he was patient. Why? Because it is God's will that all receive the, the knowledge of Jesus Christ. It is God's will that all come to repentance and not condemnation. And in the flesh, we are so quick to cast judgment that we leave very little room for repentance. And one of the things that grieves my heart, one of the things that grieves the heart of God, I believe, concerning the church today, is our inability to be patient. Something happens and we're quick to judge. Something happens and we're quick to condemn. Something happens and we're quick to, to cast out. We're quick to ostracize. We're quick to shun. And is this really how God operates? When I look in the scripture, I see King Saul, who, who completely lied to the Spirit, who completely rejected the things of God at time and time again. And even when God said enough is enough and David was anointed king, God still gave Saul time and space to repent. We look at the life of Samson, and I'm bringing up Old Testament because that's 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 where the judgment was, you know. The wages of sin is death. But here we see God in the life of Samson when God told him, this is, this is what you're not to do. This is the line you're not to cross. What did Samson do? Well, what everybody does. We see the line established. We want to cross it. But yet God gave him time for repentance. Yet God was patient for Samson. And we see in his life that God was able to 
restored him. When Samson was repented, he restored him and he gave him back his strength. That story has a lot more to do with, with physical strength. It is a powerful story of the patience and love of an almighty God. Amen. So if this is the attitude of God, should it not be our attitude? There are times that, that I've looked at certain things in, in life and I've seen, I've seen people fail and, and you know, the, the automatic thought is, you know, shame on them and, you know, you want to bring condemnation. Of course, we, we as a church, we must bring correction when someone is in sin and caught up in sin they will repent. The Bible tells us that we must restore them, that we must uh, bring correction, but it does not mean that you cancel them, that you shut them down, and that they will never have an opportunity to do the work of God again. You see, that's the way we are. We, we, we are so condemning sometimes, but if God were that way to us, we would cry foul. Unfair. Thank God he was patient with me. Thank God he's been patient with you. Even though you have sinned since you have uttered those words, Jesus come into my life. His patience has been there all along. His love for you has not diminished. Because love is patient. And it gives room for repentance. And it seeks to restore that broken relationship. If God lives in us, then His love also must become a part of our new identity in Christ Jesus. And when people hurt or annoy us, then our love needs to be patient. Our carnal nature wants to slap the other cheek, their cheek, not turn our cheek. Our flesh nature wants to, you know, go nuclear. Our flesh nature wants to get even. Our flesh nature wants to get revenge. But Jesus hung on the cross looking into the eyes of those that put him there. Said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Love is patience. No doubt we have come to God and just completely disappointed him. Countless times, yet his love has been patient for our sake. God did not do what was best for him. Jesus said, Father, if there's any other way, uh, he, he, was, he was tempted to think at that very moment, what's best for me? And isn't that what we like to say? What's best for me? What's going to be the better outcome for me? And then we justify our selfish actions right after we make that proclamation. But Jesus said, Father, not my will, but your will be done. And I know it's a tall order. I know it's something big. But I want to tell you, it is the best way of life. It is the excellent way. It is the perfected way of life that Jesus taught us to love. Be patient. And when we're patient, we're not always seeking what's best for us. We're seeking what's best for the other person. Amen? Amen. Love is also kind. How can we be kind? Well, I will. I think I'll move on to that next week. Because I have seven points on how to be kind. <laughs> but love is kind. It's not just about smiling. I like smiling, you know. We have that, that southern hospitality, you know. Aren't you glad you live in Texas? Amen. Amen. I am. <laughs> so I don't even think of political purposes. What about that too? But, you know, there are a lot of kind people in Texas. And uh, thank God we live in a, in a place that, that it's okay to, to smile at other people and say, how are you doing? You know, Strangers. I love it when people from the north come down here. It's like they're baptized in, in kindness and they don't know what to do with themselves. <laughs> but guess what? We always win them over or they get out of here as fast as they can. Either way, there's a win, right? <laughs> I'm just I'm just teasing. I know some of you from the north. I had to say that. He can say, say something. He can come up here and say something about it. 
about his text and he wanted to get, get back. <laughs> but it's a, it's a lot, it's, a, it's, it's more than just, just a smile or a kind word. It's, it's a, there's a lot to it. So I want you to be praying about that, but, but this week I think, I think what was patient, what a, what a powerful, powerful one. Ask yourself, am I patient with others? It's more than just, it's more than just that small amount of patience that you, that you just heard. It's being, it's being, it's having the ability to give people room for their error. The Bible tells us that we must forgive where God has forgiven us. If we cannot forgive, then, then there's an issue. Then there's an issue that God can't forgive us, that, that His patience is running out because we lack patience. So be praying about that. I know it's a, it's a tall one. It's a big deal. It, it's not easy, right? Am I the only one that has trouble with true patience? I mean, for some of us, we don't even have the patience to get in the car and drive down the street. Yeah. <laughs> but this is this is this is this is God patience, and to have something that is imparted in us that is God-like, it must come from God. And so I want you to begin to pray this week that Lord, Lord, help me to be patient. Help me to give people room. Help me, Lord. To love like you love me. Amen. So we'll, we'll continue next week on what love is and what love is. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your word. We thank you, God, for your, your patience towards us. God, we, we don't deserve it. But Lord, your patience is there because of your great love, your love that does not require us to even end, you know, respond. How much grieve your heart for us to condemn ourselves by rejecting you. God, we thank you for your patience. Giving us every opportunity to repent. Thank you, God, for some of us. It took us a little bit longer than others, but it doesn't matter because we're going to share that eternal reward together. We thank you, Lord, for your love for us. We thank you, Lord, for your sweet patience and forgiveness. In Jesus' name, amen.